Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to get started in just a minute. We're going to allow some time for some other folks to join us. So in the meantime, let me know where you're from. Put it in the chat so I can see where in the world you are. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Catherine Blackwell, and I am the Chief Health Equity Officer for Allergy and Asthma Network. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We are in for a real treat today with Dr. Nancy Joseph as our uh, presenter. We have a few housekeeping items before we start today's program. First, all participants will be on mute for the webinar. We're, we're gonna to record today's webinar and post it on our website within a few days. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. You can just scroll down to the bottom of the page to find our recorded and our upcoming webinars. This webinar is going to be about an hour and that includes time for questions. We're gonna take those questions at the end of the webinar, but you can put your questions in the Q&A at any time. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen there. So we'll have somebody monitoring the chat if you have questions or you need some help. We're gonna to get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. This advances webinar is in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The ACAAI offers CMEs for physicians and attendance credits for all others. You can create a free, ACAAI account and obtain CME or attendance credits through the member portal for Advances webinar. All attendees will be offered a certificate of attendance and no other continuing education is provided. A few days after the webinar, you're gonna receive an email with supplemental information and a link to download the certificate of attendance. We're gonna also try to add the link to the certificate in the chat. So let's get started. Today's topic is health disparities in allergy, asthma, and immunologic diseases. Asthma and allergy treatment has seen remarkable innovation in the last 25 years, but the progress is still not reaching everyone. More than 25 million Americans have asthma and 50 plus millions have allergies. These conditions disproportionately affect and impact Black, Hispanic, Latino, and Native American communities. Social, economic, and environmental factors often play a key role in causing asthma and allergy disparities. So join us as we explore disparities in allergy, asthma, and immunologic diseases and how to best help under-resourced communities. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nancy Joseph. Dr. Jo Joseph is a double board certified in general pediatrics and allergy immunology and is currently based in Massachusetts. She is a consultant and medical advisor for the Allergy and Asthma Network. Dr. Joseph is a member and fellow of American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and the National Medical Association in which she is active locally and nationally. She has collab collaborated with the NAACP speaking about COVID-19 during the height of the pandemic and has been featured on NMA talks as an expert panelist discussing asthma in the African-American community. Dr. Joseph has been awarded top physician under 40 by the NMA. Dr. Joseph hosts the 
How Do You Medicine podcast highlighting healthcare professionals doing medicine their way. Dr. Joseph, thank you so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. Thank you so much to the um, Allergy and Asthma Network uh, for having me and um, talking about this very, very important topic. Uh, so today we're going to touch on everything. Typically we talk about, you know, either asthma or allergy, um, but we're going to add another element, which is immunologic diseases today. So we'll touch a little bit on immunologic diseases first, and then we'll go from there. But um, as, let me make sure my slides advance. That's first. Perfect. Wonderful. So um, as uh, Catherine said, I am double board certified. That means I'm a pediatrician and an allergist. Um, and um, I see people in various, um, so that means an allergy and asthma world and the immunology world, I see everyone. Um, and then uh, specifically in the general medicine world, I only see um, pediatrics. Another thing I keep forgetting to put on my slides, if you wanna connect with me um, in the digital space, my, in, my um, Instagram is with typically where you'll find me is um, at the dynamic doc. What I will do is I'll put that in the chat now because I always forget. So I will put that um, there. And then um, I am on LinkedIn as well. And I'll put that in the chat as well. That way I don't forget because I will inevitably do so. Okay. And let me know if you have any, if you, you know, put that in the question box, if you didn't see it, you can't see it, that type of thing. And I'll repeat it. Um, so um, after the presentation, so let's get started. <clears throat> okay, I have no disclosures at this time. So some learning objectives, we're really going to, you know, hit on some stats because it's really important to um, use stats to help bring the, um, the impact to life, to really understand the impact of health disparities, why health disparities is important, and um, why we're having, you know, several webinars about it, and why it's important to, you know, come together uh, to talk about it and um, bring a, about action steps as to how we can best move forward to move the needle to promoting health equity. Um, we're going to examine the impact of health disparities on patients living with asthma, aller uh, allergic, and immunologic diseases, develop some inclusive treatment plans with community resources and possible interventions. So that's kind of the general learning objectives. And now let's talk about where we're headed more and more kind of detailed. So we'll really first, we'll, we'll define what health disparities even is, and then we'll go and talk about immunologic diseases. Again, we'll jump into um, st um, statistics about various diseases. And then um, we'll talk about how uh, health disparities are really impacting um, allergic diseases. I'll um, give you some resources and um, possible interventions. So um, it's a, a jam-packed presentation. So feel free to put some um, and some questions in the Q and A, or if you need me to go back to another slide later, I can do that as well. So first, let's really just define health disparities, right? We're having this whole webinar about um, health disparities in certain diseases, but let's first identify what they are. First, health disparity disparities really just means a lack of health equity. And by definition, um, health disparity is health differences linked to economic, social, and environmental disadvantages. So it's there are non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. That's according to the CDC. And in an article by Dr. Davis et al. Um, had the definition specifically of differences linked to economic, social, and environmental disadvantage. So health disparities affects every aspect of society and it affects social determinants of health. Um, that's really why it's very important to not only recognize it, but address it. So um, a little bit more about, I really just like this visual. I'm a visual person. I Things solidify better with me when I see them in a visual presentation. Um, and so I really want, like this um, figure because it really helps um, uh, bring home kind of social determinants of health that impact um, health disparities. And so poor uh, education access and equality, uh, inequality, 
um, neighborhood uh, and built uh, environment, social and community context, economic instability, poor health care and quality, health disparities um, that all kind of contribute to the health disparities. And so um, interventions in these areas is really what is the plan and the target because those are the areas that Im impact health equity. So I really wanted to uh, use this figure to really bring home the fact that health equity and health equality are not the same, right? Equality means same, meaning if you look at these little figures, if we were talking about equality, they'd all have, you know, one box under their under their legs, but that doesn't that's not helpful, right? Because what's what's causing one person not to reach the apple is not the same as the other. So giving them let you know one box each would not be would not be sufficient for some and would be you know too much for the other. Versus equity, right? It allows you to have equal access or equal, not equal, but um equitable access to healthcare. So then you get you get what you need with equity. Um, versus just trying to, you know, give the same thing to everyone despite them not needing the same thing. So health equity would look like, hey, this person needs three boxes, this person needs two, this person needs one. So now let's jump into health disparities specifically by disease type. So we'll talk about immunologic diseases first, but the first step is trying to understand what immunologic disease even is. Um, oftentimes when I say that I'm an allergy immunologist, the immunology part is what people have the most questions about what it even is. Um, a lot of people have heard of an allergist. A lot of people know about what, what it is to be allergic to something, but I find that immunology falls by the wayside often. So I really wanted to take this time to really talk about what immunology even is and what the immune system is. So quick, the immunology is the study of the immune system. And the immune system is what I like to call our soldier. It's, it is the system that protects you against things. So it's your body's defense. Um, you know, daily we have things trying to invade us and we need our soldiers, our immune system to really um, uh, block, you know, protect us and make sure that things don't pass our, um, you know, and go get into our system that don't need to be there. Invaders, if you will, bacteria, viruses, that type of thing. Now, not to be confused, in general, there's immune system, right? But then when at, that fights foreigners, but when your body starts to attack self, it's now called autoimmune. So typically autoimmune diseases fall into the category of other specialists, um, specialists such as rheumatology, that type of thing. Um, and then when your immune system fails, it's called you know, your immune deficiency. And that's where um, an, an immunologist like me would come in. So I call that man down when your immune system fails. Um, there's you know all or a part of it that is um, either absent or not working properly. That's what an immune deficiency is called. And um, sometimes you're born with that and sometimes you've acquired it. So that, that denotes whether or not you have a primary immune deficiency or a secondary immunodeficiency. If you have a primary immunodeficiency, typically it's inherited, typically starts in childhood. Um, you've heard of, you know, SCID or called, or in, you know, if it's called, it typically called the bubble boy disease. And those are people who have, who um, have, there's different parts of your immune system and they have more than multiple parts of their immune system missing, which makes them incredibly susceptible to disease that you that you and I would just, you know, our invader or um, our soldiers would just fight, no problem. We wouldn't even know um, the difference, but those individuals get sick really um, um, easily. Um, so those, and that would happen, that would, would have started happening since childhood. And that's typically primary immunodeficiency. But secondary immunodeficiency is an acquired thing. That means I, was I wasn't born with it and somehow I picked it up along the way. Um, one of the most uh, common ways of um, developing acquired immunodeficiency is if something, uh, a medication of some sort um, caused a demise of that particular immune system or compromise of that, such as chemotherapy, right? We know chemotherapy attacks bad cells, but in general, it also attacks other cells that are good guys too. And so that can lead to immunodeficiency and might lead to you seeing someone like me, an immunologist. So that's the nuts and bolts of what immunologic disease is. Um, let's talk about primary immunodeficiency in numbers because that's the disparity lens that we're gonna use to talk about immunologic disease. So primary immunodeficiency affects over 6 million people worldwide. One in 10,000 of people in the world has a primary immunodeficiency. 
there's it's two times as high the, the likelihood of a, or the incidence of a primary immune deficiency is twice as high in white individuals versus black and Hispanic individuals. But the caveat is it's underdiagnosed in black and Hispanic individuals. So because minorities are underrepresented in studies. So what happens is we see this number, right? It's twice as high in whites, but with the understanding that those numbers are skewed because there's a lack of representation of minorities in these studies. There's a, there are minorities tend to be underdiagnosed anyways. So, you know, this is probably the only place or very, there'll be very few places in this presentation where you'll see the number of this disease is twice as high in whites versus um, black and Hispanic individuals. However, it comes with the caveat that the number is what it is but we don't really know an accurate number because there's underdiagnosis in minority populations. So that's the immune deficiency part of this presentation. Let's jump into some the allergic part. So our first um, allergic disease that we'll talk about is food allergy. So the numbers in food allergy, first, 10% of adults in the US have food allergy. 19% of them believe that they have a food allergy. So there's 9% that may think they have food allergy, but once they get it evaluated and once they see an allergist, they, you know, it's proven that it's not a food allergy at all. And so that's that's another reason, or that's a reason to make sure that you see a specialist because you may be avoiding foods unnecessarily um, and they may not be um, what the, the matter would be. It may not be the issue. Um, so it's important to see a specialist. And now for the, in the kid, in children, one in 12 children in the US have a food allergy. So the numbers are different, whether we're talking about children um, versus adults, and we'll talk more a little bit more about that later. So let's talk about allergy in the food allergy in the black community. Food allergy is four times more frequent in African-American individuals, and they have a higher rate of death from food allergies. There's um, higher levels of various allergy cells in, um, and, um, black, in the black community. That includes a cell called IgE. Um, IgE is an allergic cell. There's, again, there's various cells around your body. Um, part of the immune system is called immunoglobulins, which, you know, that 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 um, word was thrown around a lot um, in you know, the height of COVID because that's what you use to, um, you know, the IgG as opposed to IgE is what you use to see if you're, if you've been exposed to something because the IgG is your memory uh, immunoglobulin. So people who um, I, you know, there was the IgG test to uh, COVID and that people were getting to see if they've been exposed. Um, so that's where immunoglobulins come in. They're just, you know, they're um, your body's kind of memory system to say, oh, I've seen this before. And the allergy one is called immunoglobulin E and that's the IgE. So African-American children have peanut allergy that is present eight times higher at a higher rate um, uh, than than their uh, white counterparts. And there's a higher rate of a food allergy to corn, shellfish, and fish. And there's a three times higher chance of having shellfish allergy in African-American children. They're more likely to have multiple food allergies and um, African-American children with allergic diseases or parental history of allergic diseases have a higher incidence of shellfish allergy. This is all from a study um, that was found by the, uh, um, the Ford study by with Dr. Carla Davis and, um, uh, and um, another study in 2017 that um, was done, saw these, uh, these health disparity numbers, these staggering numbers, when you get to things like eight times at a higher rate, we're really, it really brings in, that's why I love um, these, uh, you know, putting numbers on these slides, it really, you know, hones in and help brings home how huge the health disparity really is when we talk about um, the black community, especially in children. So let's talk about food allergy and research. So the genetics of that is still being studied. There's some genetic variants that occur more frequently in African-American people. Um, more studies are needed because in general, there's a lack of diversity in clinical trials, right? So their findings are helpful, but the findings don't incorporate certain populations as much or very many individuals from that population. And that's, that's you know, that's a problem. Um, European Americans are more likely to be uh, referenced in food allergy literature. They're five times more likely to be referenced in food allergy literature than African-American individuals. And access to care, which we'll talk a little bit more about later when we talk about um, um, the real issues when it comes to health disparities. Um, access to care plays a role 
Um, there's a wonderful study, the Ford study, um, that's helping combat this. And so I thought uh, it would be good to, you know, spend a little bit more time on that study um, to really highlight some good work that's being done. So the Ford study is, is a multi-standard study that um, that had white and African American children from ages zero to twelve with food allergies. So six hundred forty four participants, and they found from that study that African American children are three times high, have three times higher chance of having a shellfish allergy and two point five higher chance of having a fin fish allergy. So that's your regular fish, you know, your tuna, tilapia, etc. And there's um, less than fifty percent of them got a confirmatory testing or evaluated by an allergist. And they have a higher rate of food related and a uh, food related anaphylaxis to ER visits. I mean, um, food related. They have a higher rate of food related anaphylaxis and ER visits. So this particular, hopefully, you can see my mouse. This um, stat talking about fifty percent um, of these individuals got confirmatory testing. So remember, imagine you know all these you know you know African American children have food allergies by history, but only fifty percent of them were able to get that confirmed. That leads back to the disparity we talked about, first of all, you know, when we talked about there's 10% of individuals that actually have a food allergy versus 19% believing that they have food allergy. So in general, there is already a difference in, you know, an actual food allergy and the belief thereof. But then, um, you know, we only have with this number, we have only 50% of them getting to see an allergist to get confirmatory testing. So there's may, there may be individuals who are unnecessarily avoiding things and or maybe the reaction is not allergic in nature and more studies is needed, more testing is needed, but those individuals are not getting that test. So that's really an important thing to bring uh to really bring light to to help hone in this disparity of between not only um diagnosis but also uh, access and speed and seeing specialists. So this is what this is a food allergy action plan. As someone with a food allergy, you should always have an action plan. That is to say, what should you do? Should you have a reaction? And what should you give? Minor reactions, you know, something like just like mouth itching or hives versus like major reactions such as hives and tongue swelling, hives difficulty breathing, tongue swelling, throat tightness, that type of thing. And that's where a food allergy action plan comes in, in handy. So you, typically that's completed by your doctor and it's a guide to what to do. But research shows there's more white children that are being given those action plans than African-American children. So then it's like, okay, well, when they do see the specialists, they're not even given, you know, you know, a lot of them are given an action plan, which is, um, you know, unfortunate because that's really a great a tool to, you know, anybody taking care of that child, daycares, babysitters, it's a good, you know, form for people to have to know what to do and when. So let's talk a little bit more about um, when we talk about disparities, not only in diagnosis, but let's talk about disparities in access, right? Because when you're food allergic, it's important to have access to safe food, but then insecure food insecurity really brings a challenge to that. So there's, you know, food insecurity is limited access to good quality food and qu or quantity of food. Now, you know, the Allergy Asthma Network you can look on their website, They'll have um, ideas of how to help with those food costs because a lot of times, you know, um, allergic foods cost more um, than non-allergic, you know, not, uh, you know, the foods that are not allergy friendly. Um, fooddiversity.org has a network that includes food pantries and school nurses and physicians, and it can connect individuals with consistent and reliable sources of safe foods, which can make a world of difference if you or anyone you know have food allergies, you know, it can make a world of difference. And, and, and people with food allergies to know that this is a reliable and safe source for my, you know, for food, for um, allergy um, safe foods, allergen safe foods. Um, and then they have educational materials and they can even provide uh, gift cards. Um, and I don't know if that's the case, so don't quote me on that, but definitely that website is down here, uh, fooddiversity.org um, forward slash news. So that again, remember, if you notice, there's only one D, so it's F O O D I V E R S I T Y dot org. So another entity that's really making a huge impact in the food allergy world is the Food Equality Initiative. It's founded by um, um, Emily Brown, who is a co-founder of also something called Free From Market, which I'll touch on a little bit, but. 
it has a mission to provide people diagnosed with food allergy and celiac disease equal access to food that they need to be healthy regardless of race, geographic location, or economic status. Really, really just helping to combat the disparities in access of, of um, allergy safe foods and help fight food um, insecurity and, and, and inequity or of um, lack of food, um, lack of health equity when it comes to when it comes to food. It's it's a great organization. And she had the uh, free from access, uh, free from market, which really is an online platform with over 1500 nutrient dense foods that you can um, order from site to your door. And they, you know, and it's not even just with food allergies, it, you know, it helps with um, people with diabetes, high blood pressure, um, you know, any uh, gastrointestinal um, disorders, that type of thing. And it's a personalized diet specific food um, and it delivers straight to your door. So this is the website, attain-health.com. You have to create, uh, when you get there, you'll see this, uh, but you'll have to, it is when you click on start shopping, it asks you to create um, a, an account, or if you already have one, of course, you can just log in. And um, it's just a great source. So that's the food allergy part. Wanted to give you guys that and the access, things like that. Um, and now let's talk about eczema, um, also called atopic dermatitis. Let's start with some numbers. First, when we talked about eczema, um, in general, it affects more than 10% of children, more than 5% of adults. Um, when you have one allergic disease, you know, food allergy, asthma, um, seasonal allergies, all of those are allergic diseases. One, having one of those diseases increases the risk of another. So, in, it, so having one of those diseases increases the risk of developing eczema, aka atopic dermatitis. Um, we uh, typically, it's one of the first diseases that we call, we call the atopic march. So what happens is um, oftentimes people who are, you know, that have prone to allergic diseases, they'll have eczema first and then they'll develop another allergic disease, um, typically food allergies, and then they'll develop asthma or seasonal allergies. So that's what we call the atopic march. That is, you're just marching through the atopic diseases. So let's talk about eczema. Um, or atopic dermatitis in a black community. Um, and again, atopic dermatitis is a, is a technical term, um, it's, you know, talking about, you know, different types of, um, um, I, and specifically in this particular presentation, I'm using it equaling to eczema, um, but just know um, that sometimes um, the vernacular may be a little bit different. Um, if you have any uh, questions, you know, with, you know, a term, let's say you see your doctor and they're using, um, you know, a different type of dermatitis, make sure you, uh, you ask them, you know, so what is that exactly? I'm saying this because I don't want to, sometimes in the medical world, we can get, um, you know, lost in the vernacular. We may not quite, you know, get it. So I wanted to make sure to just plug that in um, here to let you guys know um, that in this particular presentation, I'm using a eczema um, in atopic dermatitis interchangeably. Sometimes that's not the case um, in other uh, settings. So um, when we talk about eczema, it affects black individuals at a higher rate than white individuals. Black children are um, less likely to see a dermatologist, twice as likely to get diagnosed with atopic dermatitis though, and they're twice as likely to have a severe form, but, and they have twice as many office visits, three times as many missed schools, all because of their eczema. So again, really staggering numbers um, for this particular disease. It has a higher disease burden um, in the Black community. Um, again, again, they're more prone to have more, dis more severe disease, and of course, it lasts longer, therefore, higher disease burden. Um, they, it's important to see, to note here, that individuals in the Black community have decreased genetic risks for atopic dermatitis, yet they have an increased likelihood of having severe disease. Black children are almost six times less likely to have the mutation that causes the um, the um, uh, that causes eczema. Right, there's a genetic mutation that makes you more prone to having severe eczema. Black children are six times less likely to have that particular mutation. So what we can take, you know, what we take away from this is genetics is not the full picture. In fact, it's not even the majority of the picture. So the, the though the extent of the genetic effect is unclear due to a lack of diversity, and here we go with that diversity in research, right? There's a lack of diversity in research. So we don't know the extent at which genes affect the eczema in the black community. But what we do know is the genetic mutation that we do know leads to um, severe eczema. 
black you know, children are less likely to have it. So then that leads you to believe that there's way, there's other um, um, effects, there's other issues at hand that's really causing this disparity. So it's definitely not, you know, something that we can just point to genetics as to why th these numbers are so much higher and so staggering. So when we talk about, you know, that leads us to talk about really health disparities when it comes to eczema, it's, it's you know, it's multifactorial, right? Which is what I was getting to, socioeconomic status, um, being one of the factors. Lower socioeconomic status leads to more severe atopic de um, dermatitis. Um, it's a multidimensional factor. Um, societal position, wealth, and access to resources are all factors that's involved in socioeconomic status. Um, structural racism is also, um, you know, contributes to health disparities, uh, social determinants of health, and then physical environment. So there's a study that showed that Black children in highly segregated communities tend to have more severe eczema. So then again, we're not even, this is not even taken in, it's not genetics, right? We, we know that already. Uh, there are social constructs, you know, that are in place that then lead to physical uh, manifestations. And so yet we talk about segregation, just a highly segregated community alone has been shown to be associated with severe atopic dermatitis. So let's talk about what it even is, right? We talked about the numbers, talked about the disparities of said numbers, but let's just quickly take a quick little pause and talk about what is even eczema? What is even atopic dermatitis? Really, it's an inflammatory disease. It's what we call relapse and remitting. Um, I'm not remitting, uh, relapse and remitting. It's really just a waxing and waning of nature is really what relapse and remitting means. It's an inflammatory process and it can be inherited or acquired. Um, we talked a little bit about the genetics already. Um, we talked about um, um, the genes and the less likelihood of Black children to have that. Let's talk about the skin integrity and the effects of eczema on that. Well, eczema is really a breakdown in skin integrity. So what happens is you're decreasing the skin barrier function that way. And what happens is you have more water loss, right? Your skin is compromised, doesn't hold in water like it's supposed to. You have enhanced water loss. Enhanced water loss leads to dry skin. Dry skin leads to itchy skin. You scratch the skin. You get the skin all inflamed, and then now you have a scratch itch cycle. So now in general, um, you scratch because you itch, and then you itch because you scratch. I uh, know you guys have heard that before. And so you really, it's just kind of, um, uh, you know, a never ending futile cycle. It can end, but I mean, you know, without treatment or addressing it. So I really just, I'm going to be on this slide for just a couple of seconds. I just really wanted to talk about, you know, what it looks like in various skin um, and how important it is to note that, it, you know, eczema looks different on various skins. And that's important to note because sometimes it'd be underdiagnosed depending um, on this and the skin color. It's really, um, no, it's definitely very itchy. It's red lesions that could be plaques or patches. Depending on the age, it tends to be more face and torso and legs for the infants and young children. And it tends to be in flexor surfaces. That means these um, that that tend to be in flexor surfaces are older children, um, dry scaly patches in adults. Um, but chronic um, atopic dermatitis leads to a thick and leathery skin, which is what you see here, um, uh, which we call in the medical world lichenification. Um, and, you know, all that itching from the dryness and all of that really decreases your lack, you know, with the, your sleep. So lack of quality sleep decreases lack of quality of life. Um, we all know how important sleep is. And so something disturbing your sleep, especially chronically, is certainly, um, you know, sure to affect your quality of life. But also, again, notice when we talk about redness, right, if we're depending on redness to diagnose a particular disease, that's going to, that's a faulty way um, to, to, that's a faulty, uh, dependence because with in, in darker skin, where you're not seeing the redness. So if you're depending on the redness, to diagnose something, you're going to misdiagnose or underdiagnose a population. So we talked about the quality of life that it has, uh, effect that it has on, um, the particular individuals, but more specifically, it does also affect the mental health of the caregiver. It impacts, um, um, your, uh, mental health, whether you're an adult, or a child, and adults with the um, atopic dermatitis found to have increased propensity to have anxiety and depression, and kids have increased risk of developing uh, ADHD. Um, so really, uh, it affects everywhere. And then 
in general, right? There's a lack of understanding of the disease, especially as a chronic disease. And so, you know, the perception of others may be like, ah, oh, man, this person just never takes care of their skin or they never, you know, moisturize. And without the understanding that, hey, this person has an increased propensity to having dry skin and to having um, the scaliness and, you know, those examinous patches. And so it's not, you know, that person's fault, right? It's, it's not, you know, a lack of geez, that person doesn't take care of themselves or doesn't really moisturize well. It's really, you know, the increased propensity. So it's a lot, the, the, that lack of understanding of what eczema is and what really gives way to, to that um, um, skin uh, lichenification and the dryness and things like that um, really can affect the perception of others and really how that person feels, how you make that person feel that does have eczema. So I really just wanted to um, show what eczema can look like in various skin um in various skin of color so in general if you are worried about something or there's skin changes that you're worried about talk to your doctor you want to make sure you advocate for yourself it's better to ask than to not ask so treatment costs of um eczema is you know again cost is a barrier for it when it comes to equity so medication black patients with atopic dermatitis spend more out of pocket for medication, ER visits, and lab tests. Now, again, we talked about that stat that they have increased chance of having, um, of, of going to the ED because of, of their eczema. So of course they spend a lot of more, op, you know, they go to the ED more, so they spend more out-of-pocket money when it comes to ER visits. Um, um, so it's because of a decrease, that might be because of a decrease um, health care access um, and under diagnosis by PCP, all of which we talked on, right? You're waiting for redness to diagnose, you're going to underdiagnose. Then there's a lack of health access to healthcare, which increases your, you know, your chance of going to uh, the ED for something that maybe if you had a better access um, or you know better treatment options or better access um, to a primary care doctor or subspecialist, maybe you know there'd be less ED visits. Maybe there'd be better management of that particular disease, et cetera. So it's really all interconnected. So there are some pay some programs. And this goes for every, not just eczema, but just in general, there are some programs that could help save the cost uh, of medications like GoodRx, Blink Health, um, pharmacy um, prescription programs, um, there's drug assistance programs or generic drug options, right? We've all known, you know, sometimes, you know, buying something like uh, uh, Benadryl or Zyrtec, is, you know, that's the name brand. You certainly can buy diphenhydramine or cetirizine, and that's the generic form. And oftentimes that's cheaper than having to buy the particular name brand. So particularly when we went to see a specialist when it comes to eczema, um, you just wanna make sure that if the eczema is not getting better, you noted a particular food trigger of that eczema, like, hey, if I don't eat this food, I don't have uh, an eczema flare. Then you wanna see an allergist during that time. And then in general, talk to your doctor. They'll help you decide if you need to see a specialist. If so, what specialist to see? Um, and just know that they're there for you. Work in conjunction um, to help determine what the most appropriate thing is. So I'm going to go through this preparing for a doctor's visits here. But know that I really wanted to put it at the end of the slide, but I'm going to kind of drive home to help this the, the equity piece of this presentation um, more at the end. Um, so it just happens to fit better here. Um, but just in general, when we're talking about how to get ready to see a doctor and what things that you should know, you know, oftentimes as a specialist, sometimes people may feel overwhelmed. Um, you know, when you come see the doctor, you're not, you know, again, as a specialist, you're just not sure what they need to know. And maybe, you know, they're asking you questions and you think, and you're like, oh gosh, I don't know all this. I didn't know you were going to ask me all this. And so this is, um, you know, think of this as my cheat sheet for you of things you want to know. So that way you're, you're prepared when you go and see a, a doctor, especially a specialist, you're prepared um, for those questions because that specialist, we are just now meeting, especially as a new patient. And so we're going to ask you some more specific questions, some detailed questions. And this is my cheat sheet for you to get prepared. So first timeline is important. When did, it, when did your um, symptoms start? And again, the doctors don't need specifics. They don't need to know you started on January 15th at nighttime. You just need to know in general. Oh, it started about five months ago. Or it started about five years ago. That type of thing. And you want to know any triggers, right? So when you want to come in and give us as much information as you can, 
or specific information, right? Oh, you know, I notice when I do this, it gets worse. Um, when I do this, it gets better, that type of thing. And then if your doctor's done some tests, what do they do? What do they find? That way it helps us rule out certain things and then um, help uh, help us with a list of possibilities for your particular symptom. Also, you want to make sure you keep track of um, what things you've tried, you know, as opposed to, you know, my doctor tried a cream, it didn't work. You want to say, oh, my doctor tried, let's say a steroid cream, it didn't work. My doctor tried um, in, uh, an antihistamine, it didn't work. My doctor tried, um, you know, whatever the pill is, you want to at least know maybe the general category um, or, you know, a lot of times in your particular chart, the patient chart, either have the medications that the doctor has given. Sometimes if you go to the same system, you know, you know, your specialist can see that and sometimes they may not be able to. So you want to make sure you have that information um, and you want to know, hey, this is what I was on and it did work or it didn't work. And you want to bring us, you know, pertinent family history. Maybe this is the time to ask, you know, your mom, hey, does any, did anybody ever have any issues with eczema? Or sometimes did they have any, had any issues with itchy skin or did they have any skin conditions, that type of thing? Because it may be possible that you never have talked about it or never thought to talk about it in terms of family history. So that's my cheat sheet for you for a doctor's visits specifically, especially if you're going to see a specialist. So now let's jump into some asthma numbers real quick. Um, I'm going to go through this kind of um, fast because I want to talk about um, some health disparity um, issues and interventions. So asthma is important. Why is it important? Why do we talk about it when it comes to health disparity? And the answer is 26 million Americans live with asthma. It's a huge business burden. And it's the number one cause of missed school days. And when it comes to asthma and health equity, it affects African-American people more, especially in underserved areas. And the prevalence in an in, in African-American population is increasing. Asthma prevalence is indirectly proportional to income. So as income decreases, asthma prevalence increases. So then let's talk about specifically the numbers when it comes to asthma in African-American individuals. African-American individuals are 30% more likely to have asthma. They're three times more likely to go to an emergency room. There, there we go with that emergency room visit again. Um, three times more likely to succumb to asthma death. We talked about that with food allergies, right? Um, you know, again, if you're likely to more have to have more severe disease, you're more likely to get elevated care, right? And it, which is in the ED, um, among other things, among other um, uh, environments. But the emergency room visits are increased. And when it comes to asthma in children, the uh, the 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 stats even more staggering. African American children are seven times more likely to have a, an asthma death than their non Hispanic white counterparts. These numbers alone are reasons why we're even having the conversation when it comes to African Americans and asthma, when it comes to health disparities. Health disparities is important. We know that. I like numbers because numbers don't lie. Numbers tell you why things are important. Numbers can drive home why we got to do what we have to do. Numbers can drive home why it's important to, to increase the representation in general, whether we're talking about research, we're talking about in the clinical setting, talking about our environment, our communities, who gives, you know, we want to make sure that we bring home to you why these are these talks are important and why we don't we we wanted to take your lunch time today to talk about it. So what can be done? What to, I'll talk more in general later, but what can be done about asthma in general? First, awareness is key. Without knowledge, the people perish is a common term, um, a common phrase. We want to increase awareness of asthma and education. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, education of asthma and allergic diseases and the impact they have. There are some partnerships that we have. You know, again, the Asthma and Allergy Network, the National Medical Association, which you know is is uh, near and dear to my heart. It's an, org an organization that really helps combat disparities. It represents over it's for it represents over 25,000 African American um, or physicians of African descent. And it really helps with uh, uh, um, drive home health equity and really helps um, create a voice for uh, a minority patient. So that's the National Medical Association. And of course, there's the EPA, um, Environmental Protection Agency. So you want to make sure that you, uh, you know, if you want to go to these uh, organizations' websites, that really helps. Um, um, and you get to know them and what work they're doing and maybe how you can get involved. We, you know, the... Um, 
Asthma Allergy Network has the Pet Trusted Messenger Program, which is which helps with patient education. Um, you know, talks like this help with the process because it increases or with the with the um, with the um, health increasing health increasing health awareness health awareness of health disparities, especially in asthma. Um, you want to be a voice for health equity again getting involved in your community, getting involved in research, me seeing where in the National Medical Association or Asthma Allergy Network, you can be uh, of help. Um, legislation is important. The Asthma Allergy Network, uh, the um, Allergy Asthma Network does um, a call, uh, the Allergy and Asthma Day on the Hill, which is where we go and advocate for legislation that really helps move the needle forward when it comes to um, you know health equity and the allergy asthma space. Um, help allergy practitioners help um, you know legislation helps allergy practitioners um, in general and it helps us help you it helps us better serve you and you want to you know gathering of like minds is always important you know webinars such as this going to maybe a summit being um, um, going to you know conferences for us as a provider is helpful but for you there's various groups and support groups you can join that really help you not only learn about what the problem is, but help you move the needle forward in terms of being a voice. So let's, um, I'm going to uh, close out with really talking about what one of the big, the big picture here when it comes to health equity. Um, asthma stats alone demonstrate the need for equity, especially in children, um, because the children's our future. But let's talk about more specific representation, health equity and how we can, um, um, what the issues are and how can we address them. Um, representation matters less than, we talks about people like me, like allergists, less than 5% of us are black. Um, the Journal of Allergy, the uh, um, JAMA um, found that the presence of a black physician in a particular um, county improves in many aspects of a community's health. Just one, just this presence. That doesn't mean that they have to be their, their doctor. They don't have to be any, none of that. Just the presence of a black physician in a particular county improves adherence to treatment, means that people there are let more likely to get preventative care, and there's decreased mortality of the black patients. The first two, adherence to treatment and more likely to get preventative care, was not just black patients, but specifically in, in terms of black patients, it increased, it decreased mortality. So representation matters. That's why we're having these talks. That's why we're, we're bringing awareness to health disparities. Um, and now talking about health disparities, I wanted to close out with how we get here and how we get out of here. First, let's talk about I, this, this visual was, is, I saw this and was like, this is amazing. Really talking about, um, you know, how we got here, right? Uh, structural inequities. It led to race and ethnicity, language barriers, um, um, psycho, uh, psychosocial stressors, that type of thing. Um, again, there's upstream and downstream um, factors that led to health disparities. So research and institutional barriers, we've talked about that, um, you know, uh, decreased diversity, diversity in research personnel, there's decreased diversity in research participants in general, there's built environmental exposures, there's housing insecurities, there's redlining, there's um, segregation, ho housing quality, um, increased exposures to allergens and at school, um, again, they're a problem. Right? When we talk about allergic diseases, um, increased allergens are not helpful with that. Um, structural barriers um, for care and delivery in allergy immunology. There is a, a decreased diagnosis and treatment. We talked about how um, African Americans are less, you know, less to be diagnosed, um, or less likely to be diagnosed in general with the, you know, with different allergic diseases. We also talked about um, how they're less likely to get something like a, a food allergy action plan, right? So all of those things um, decrease. Um, Access decreases diagnosis and decreases treatment. And we talked about underdiagnosing. Therefore, you can't treat something that you're not diagnosed. So if you're thinking, hey, I'm looking for redness for eczema, um, and then you're underdiagnosed with someone's eczema, that means they're they're being they're not being treated for what they really have. So decreased access to specialists, right? That's an issue. We talked about less than five percent of allergists are um are uh, black. Um, you know, there's attention to psychosocial needs that are not met. Um, there's increased prevalence of uh, the adverse health that leads to adverse health outcomes downstream, right? Um, the increased prevalence of their, uh, different diseases we talked about. And so, um, you know, therapeutic hesitancy, which is an interesting, you know, which is a way to say, 
hey, I'm hesitant to take this because I'm not, I don't know about it. I'm not, I'm not there's a trust issue there, that type of thing. So all of these are the road upstream and downstream factors that are on our road to how we got to our health disparities and how we are where we are. So let's talk about where we can go from there. So again, this article um, by Udimba and, uh, and Al really brings home some, some suggestions as to um, how we can intervene. You know, here on this, you know, I'll touch on a couple of them per category, increasing equity training, right? Um, it's important for us to, sometimes we all come from different backgrounds. And so what we saw, what we think in terms of, you know, our biases, we all have biases. Um, we have, we sometimes we have these microaggressions that we aren't aware of and things like that. And so equity training um, helps with that um, participatory empowerment of education and education of at-risk communities, um, active recruitment of diverse patient cohorts, which we talked about um, increasing representation in, 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 um, in um, uh, research, um, recruiting staff from different backgrounds, right? You know, if you have a diverse staff doing, you know, um, increasing in research uh, or recruiting for research, it increases the chance that you might have it at, you know, a, di a diverse and um, um, population of research participants. Um, advocacy and policy work, which we talked about, um, to the end, you know, that could help increase access to clean and safe housing. Um, reimbursement services, which we, we really spoke about when it comes to food insecurities and food deserts and things like that. Um, you know, track, tracking care gap data in the EN, you know, EMR, that really helps us bring home, um, you know, hey, you know, at-risk populations, for at-risk populations, tracking that data to help us get the information that we need. Um, and then um, going from there. And these are just, of course, there are maybe you know, other things that we can do, but really just, I, I felt like these were really great proposed interventions by this article that really helps, hey, this is where we've been. These are things that could really help us get out of this incredible health equity, this, this, this unfortunate um, health equity, so, uh, um, health disparity situation that we're in. So that is my spiel. Um, I wanted to make sure I leave enough, at least 10 minutes for questions. Um, if this was, if you have any, um, any slides you want me to go back to also let me know. Um, but with that, I'll give it back, bring it back to Catherine and I will stop sharing my screen. Wow. 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 Dr. Joseph, that was a lot of great, um, information, um, as always. And there's a, there's a couple things, um, that I want to, uh, bring up, and this might even be a topic for your next podcast, I don't know, um, but you talked about the alarming numbers of, um, you know, the, the four times more frequent in African American uh, with, with regards to food allergies and, the, you know, 30% more children at risk for in the Black community at asthma. And what I have seen um, out in the field, as well as being a healthcare professional, being a nurse myself, a lot of the folks, and being African American female, a lot of the uh, folks in our community, they don't even really know about food allergies. If they if they eat something, not that they don't know about it, but they just interpret it a different way. If they eat something that doesn't agree with them, they'll say, "Oh well, it gave me indigestion. Let me take a Pepsid or a Tums," or you know, I I ate this you know tomato or these strawberries and I broke out yeah, I'll just take a Benadryl. And they just keep on going. And then they're, they're, it comes into play where they don't have access to an allergist, right? They go to their primary care physician. So access is a problem. You have a lot of the, the folks that live in um, underserved communities in a food desert where there's always Chinese restaurants or McDonald's or whatever. And you have a single mother with like four or five children who are, you know, they, she just wants to get her children fed. So she just does the best that she can. So, you know, the, 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 the good veggies and the you know, fresh produce and all that stuff is not available to them. So it's, it's a whole lot of social determinants of, of, of health that impact this. And it's such a big problem. And I, you know, I want to save the world just like you do. Uh, like where do, where do we start? And how do we bring more awareness about food allergies? Because that's really crucial in the community. And they're just, I just don't see the uptake. Right. And so you brought, you, you know, actually we brought the answer and the answer is awareness, right? The first step to solving a problem is knowing that you have a problem. 
And so the first step to solving health equity is even knowing what, what, what it looks like, what it is, where it is, that type of thing. And then when we talk about food allergies, again, you can't help someone's food allergy if they didn't know they had food allergy. So when I see patients in clinic, my first step is really to educate, right? Um, ed educate um, and, uh, hey, this is what allergy is. This is what allergy isn't. Because what's happening is there's a mislabeling, right? Some people think they have allergies, they don't. Some people have allergies, they don't think they do. You know, there's a don't agree with me versus I have allergy, right? And so what's happening is if you say, you know, you may you may not report it, right? If you don't think it's an allergy and I'm asking about your medical history and you may not, you might, you may not report it. So now we're talking about something else and all this time you've had, you know, shellfish allergy. And then, right, when we talk about when you don't report it and you don't think you have an allergy, that means there's a lack of family history information. Because maybe your mom did and your grandma both have food allergies and you didn't even know because they didn't think about it that way. And now this whole time you've had, you know, a whole generational history of allergic diseases that you had no idea of. Well, right. you know what, your grandmother, shellfish didn't agree with her, but we just, you know, she just, whatever, you know, and no one had an EpiPen, no one, you know, that type of thing. Um, so it's really knowledge. First, you want to increase awareness. We want to increase education of what it is to be allergic, what it is to have allergy. And we really want to destigmatize allergy, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times there's a stigma when it comes to allergy, when it comes to EpiPens, I'm sorry, yeah. or epinephrine auto injectors. When we talk about um, uh, having an epinephrine auto injector, there are people who are, who, you know, but I don't need one. It's like, well, we give it to you for because of a risk of um, having an anaphylactic reaction, um, right? Like you don't get car insurance because you're accident prone. You get car insurance because you can have an accident. We don't, you know, that type of thing because we know the risk of it happening is high enough in which we want to prevent it. Um, when it comes to asthma, there's a stigma against the word asthma being diagnosed as such. There are individuals that have history incredibly consistent with asthma, but they don't, if you don't tell the person the diagnosis of asthma, then they'll say, no, well, that's never, th that word has never been said to me, but they're on, you know, dual action inhalers, albuterol. And so, right. So if we're treating it like asthma, now we're not telling the patient they have asthma. What are we really doing? Are we really just saying, oh, you know, sometimes I get difficulty breathing when I, when I have, you know, colds, but otherwise, because right. When we talk about something like COVID, a proper mm -hmm. diagnosis of asthma helps risk stratify a person when we talk about COVID and having something like Paxlovid, that type of thing. But if you were never told you had asthma, you never think you have asthma. If you don't think you have asthma, then you, you can't properly put yourself at what a particular risk category, let's say at the height of pandemic, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. knowledge is really the first step. And without that, everything crumbles. If you right. don't have knowledge and you don't have awareness, whether we're talking about allergic diseases or any disease, then we're in an uphill battle. Right. And before I forget, I wanted to bring up the other, I forgot to bring up the other, um, the other webinars that is happening. And that is my fault, everyone. So I'm going to quickly share my screen for no other reason, but to say that we're having a webinars coming up that I wanted to bring up. Um, can you guys, you guys probably can see my screen. I'll put it in. Um, the next webinar is on childhood asthma, August 21st. Oh, I'm sorry, Smart Therapy, um, July 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern, Smart Therapy and Other Patient-Centered um, Approaches. And then after that webinar, there's Childhood Asthma, August 21st. Um, and then there's August 27th with Seasonal <clears throat> Allergies. So I wanted to make sure I said that, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. But mm -hmm. I wanted to let you guys know that there's two July um, um, webinars, and there's one August webinar coming up so you guys, because I know if some people are hop on, hopping off, I wanted to make sure, but we'll get to some questions. I'm sorry, you guys. That's okay. That's okay. One of the questions is, are there, <clears throat> excuse me, are there any cultural or dietary practices among Hispanics that can influence allergy and asthma management? You mean, talk to me about allergy and asthma management. What you mean? You mean practices that would keep them from taking their inhalers? Or tell me a little bit more about. Um, well, I mean, I mean that person that that of course typed the, the question. Is it on the Q and A? I don't think on it, the Q and A. Yeah, okay. I didn't. Uh, that's all the person said. Let me see if they have it in the chat. Maybe you can. I'm sorry, it's in the chat. It is oh, in the okay, chat. Oh, okay, it is in the chat. Yeah. Um. 
can you give me a little bit more specific that can influence allergy and asthma management? Now, do you now asthma and allergy in general, but tell me about more what you mean by um, influence allergy and asthma management specifically. Um, and someone asks, um, oh, you're welcome. Yes, photographs with skin issues, that's important. Um, and there was and one. Eugene, I don't specifically, not right, not up to up um, on hand. I don't have the numbers specifically in public housing. But what we do know is that the environmental factors that tend to be associated with that increases the um, the development or the risk. I'm sorry for asthma. How close do you live to a highway? Um, urban um, urban population or I'm sorry, urban settings increases the um, you know the chance uh, and prevalence of asthma. So, but specific numbers, I do not have that currently. And I think oh, someone wants me to list the upcoming webinars again. I will do okay. that. Let me make sure that I answer um, that, that question I didn't get to. So I'll just generally answer that dietary practice question because I don't think they gave me any. Um, so sometimes depending on the culture, you can, it could just be an allergen field diet you know, depending. So if you have, um, maybe you have, you know, a heavy seafood diet or something like that, just in general, culturally, um, that may make it hard for someone, let's say with shellfish allergies or fish allergies to, you know, participate in various cultural practices and that type of thing. So that can really help, um, that can really affect uh, one of the keystones of um, management, which is avoidance, right? It's really hard if your culture is, if, if I, you know, if you gluten allergic and your culture is really, you know, heavily rice and heavily, you know, it's really hard. Um, you know, you'll feel, you know, sometimes people feel left out and things like that. And there's uh, cultural practices that make it hard from, from that perspective. Um, in terms of asthma, right, we know there's a lot of um, maybe cultural practices that, that treat asthma historically, and that may not be as effective for that particular individual. And um, it may be hard to try to convince you know, maybe one person in your family wants you to manage your asthma this way, but you're like, I saw my doctor and they want me to use these. And again, that's what I mean by, you know, that's one of the aspects of destigmatizing asthma and destigmatizing, destigmatizing um, the treatment used for inhalers, understanding that your health practitioners are trying to um, work and, can, you know, work with you to help you. They're not, no one, you know, we, we aren't trying to, you know, dismantle anything that's helped you in the past or dismantle any beliefs. We're really just trying to, hey, research has shown these are really helpful um, in terms of inhalers and things like that. And I want to make sure, I, you know, we know what's in them because they're, you know, monitored by the FDA. So I really want you to, you know, use this and, um, you know, complementary medicine um, cannot be, you know, we, we you know, there's no, um, we're not against that at all. We just also want to make sure that we we do the best we can to um, adequately manage your asthma. But I can understand there's some cultural practices that um, may be, you know, something that needs to be addressed when we're talking about um, holistic view, holistic practice, and holistically treating someone. I hope that answers your question. Um, oh, wonderful. There's um, in the chat, there is a link to the next webinar, which is July 26th. Um, mm -hmm. So wonderful, wonderful. You can click on that. Perfect. Yeah. So I think that we are at the top of the hour, actually a little bit after the hour. Did um, we miss any questions? I'm so sorry. No, no, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. You did, Everything's great. You answered everything. Thank you so much. This has been really informative. And I, I just want to go over the, you know, the webinars coming up again so people can hear it as well. Um, first up, as Dr. Uh, Joseph had mentioned, is smart therapy and other patient-centered approaches towards asthma management, and that's going to be presented by Dr. Angela Hogan on July 25th at 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Then we'll come back to Dr. Dave Stukas on August 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to talk about childhood asthma and how to teach children how to use their inhalers, which is going to be great. Um, and then on August 27th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to welcome Dr. Ann Maitland to discuss seasonal allergies and optimizing treatment for each patient. So you'll receive an email from Zoom in a few days with a link to the recording and evaluation and additional resources. So thank you again from all of us at Allergy and Asthma Network and join us as we work every day to breathe better together and close the gap in disparities and improve health equity. Have a good afternoon.
Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.